Okay, welcome everyone to today's Scandinav seminar. Um, today we're very happy to have William Wicha Krempa from uh, joining us from University of Montreal. William is an expert on quantum criticality and in particular on transport near quantum critical points, for example, in using CFT techniques to address condensed matter um, problems. And he's also worked a lot on, on entanglement entropy. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about some results uh, that he and his collaborators have found on um, super universality and the shape of fluctuations and, and entanglement. Um, so William, take it, take it away. Uh, can you all hear me? It's good? Yes. Yeah, perfect. So uh, merci Lucas for uh, first inviting me and then introducing me. It's my pleasure to uh, talk to you guys. Uh, it's been a while since I gave a talk at the Get Enough Center. So hopefully I'll be able to visit eventually, but uh, in the meantime, this is the best we can do. Um, so the seminar will be based on this following preprint, which appeared last month and is entitled Cornering the Universal Shape of Fluctuations. And I'll add stuff about entanglement at, at the end, the last third, roughly. Uh, this preprint was done in collaboration with my uh, French colleagues, Benoit Estienne uh, at Sorbonne University and Jean-Marie Stéphane at uh, Lyon. They're both faculty. Um, so since there's no one junior in this paper, we only know one third of the material. So if you have questions, uh, there's a one chance out of three I can answer. Um, no, seriously, I, probably better than that. And I also have uh, I'll show some results from previous entanglements with these people. Uh, so Roger Malka, Rob Myers, Pablo Bueno, Subir, a lot of students uh, at Montreal and elsewhere. Um, and yeah, I'll show some references, even though I have to apologize in advance for not having complete references. I just finished this talk um, now, and it's not actually finished. So <laughs> for next iteration, I'll add more references. Uh, I apologize in advance. The paper, uh, this archive has more references. Plan is simple, three parts, but really only two parts of first two. So number one, I'll talk about the geometry of bipartite fluctuations and how a concept that we call spring universality emerges. Um, we're, we'll be examining these geometries, this pie-shaped region with a corner. We'll see why there's a lot of good reasons. Um, in part two, I'll talk about the geometry of entanglement entropy. That's a much harder question and will be much more restrictive on the systems there. And we'll see that there we only have quote unquote quasi spring universality. And I'll mention an intriguing uh, connection between points one and two briefly. All right, fluctuations, part one. So, fluctuations, that's only one word, but people sometimes use the variance, the uh, quantum uncertainty uh, to describe how a given observable O fluctuate uh, between different measurements. Um, so written as follows here, delta O squared, it's the variance, which is probably the most general mathematically, is simply the average of the deviations from the mean squared, otherwise you get zero if you don't square it. And that's the average of O squared minus the average of O that squared. So we all know that, and this appears quite prominently in quantum physics. Uh, for example, in Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So here the average, I'm gonna be very agnostic about it actually. Um, it's taken with respect to some quantum density matrix, not even equilibrium. I'm not telling you in advance what it is. It could also be some purely classical statistical distribution or some other distribution. Um, we'll see, it's quite, uh, quite general. Um, in physics, to come back to uh, the lab, we often deal with local observables. So this observable O is an integral. Okay, so here I'm in a continuum because that'll be more convenient, but you can also think about the lattice. So in a continuum, it's uh, an integral over some local density. So rho of R is density of operator O. Okay, rho of R could be the electric charge, the spin, the energy density, the density of bacteria, <laughs> and so forth. Okay. Given a local observable like this, we can ask a more refined question. 
which is what are the fluctuations of the observable over a spatial subregion A? So now I'm going to ask about fluctuations of OA. OA is simply the integrated density over subregion A. So for example, um, A could be the square here in red, and A complement is the rest of the system. Okay, so now I want to ask this more refined question. How much does O fluctuate inside A? And that's what we call bipartite. It's a bipartition of the system. So we want to compute this quantity, delta O squared, delta O A squared. So as before, it's this combination. And using the uh, local integral expression, we get this simple form. Uh, so the integral uh, over A twice of the connected correlation function, rho r, rho r prime. Connected means the average of rho r times rho r prime minus the product of averages. Okay. So that's very good. Now to make some progress, I'm gonna put more restrictions on the states and observables. Okay, so we're gonna focus on translation invariant and isotropic states and a scalar observable scalar in the rotations. In that case, this variance inside the region A of O can be written as this thing because the connected correlation function is a function of the difference of the coordinates. Okay, so this is a spatial difference between R and R prime. Obviously, F depends very strongly on the state and the observable you choose. So it's hard to see what you can see in general from this expression. Uh, and in fact, we have to impose a bit more constraints to uh, to see a general structure emerge. And this constraint is that we're going to ask that F decays fast enough at large separations. Okay. And I'm going to make that uh, very specific at how large we want it to be. And if it's not large enough, if the decay is not fast enough, we'll see what happens in that case with one example. All right, so we have a region A. We can divide it into an interior, a boundary, and the rest is not for the region, but it's for the expansion of the variance. So when the region A has a big volume, has a large interior, for typical states, we have the following expansion. So the variance goes as the first term is what we call the volume law or the interior law. So there's a coefficient alpha, and this goes as the volume of A or the area in 2D. Then there's a term that goes as the length of the boundary, prefactor beta. And then there's a rest, I'm gonna call that minus BA. The sign is not actually that important. Um, and our goal will be to understand this rest. But let me tell you first about the first two terms. So the leading term is a volume law and often like in many situations. And this just tells you that fluctuations are extensive, okay? And the coefficient alpha can be extracted very simply from the F function. It's just the integral over all space of F of R. And that can be written more simply as S of zero. What is S of K? It's the spatial free transform of F of R, also known as the static structure factor or as the static susceptibility of observable O. And notice that these integrals are over all space. So that's alpha, and it's not very interesting. It's um, zero to order information about this correlation function. So let's go to the next term. Things become already more interesting, the boundary law. So in our paper with uh, Jean-Marie and Benoit, we, we found this expression in general for given F. There's a prefactor that depends on pi and a gamma function. D is the spatial dimension, and this integral now is over the radial coordinate. So we simplified it a bit. And so it's integral over r to the d times f. So in two dimensions, it's r squared times f. And now let's try to rewrite this in terms of this, the, the static structure factor, s. So if you do one line of algebra, you find that this coefficient beta becomes the integral over the modulus of k of s of k over k squared. And that's not something transparent or nice. In fact, this integral depends on the full structure factor. So contrary to alpha, the boundary law coefficient is a microscopic quantity, okay? It depends on the full correlation function F. 
or the full information of, of S, not only the small wave vector part. And this is a situation that's very analogous to what happens to the entanglement entropy. If you already know, beta is also very microscopic in that case. That's a question. So here, yeah. beta is uh, positive? Or it depends. Can it have either sign? <laughs> here, uh, at this point in time, yes. It, it's positive. No, no, it can be have both signs. Uh, it depends on the center goal, which I see. a priori. And in S of K, you're removing the S of zero part. There's no low, small K uh, singularity. So if the small K singularity is too strong, then this is invalidated and one needs to adapt this formula. Okay. But in general, you don't need to do anything. This is what emerges from the F correlation function. Why can I ask? So why is if you're restricting yourself to some region A, yep. how is this integral an integral out to infinity rather than cut off by the uh, the boundary of A? Very good question. So all the information about the choice of region A is encoded in this prefactor. So norm of delta A is the length of the boundary of region A. And beta is a very microscopic quantity. It doesn't depend on the shape of A. So the shape only appears through the length of the perimeter, for example, in two dimensions. Um, so this can be derived starting with any region A, and you'll find the same prefactor beta for any shape you take. So it's, it's a very um, local quantity that doesn't care about the choice of your submanifold A. Yeah. So, to compute it, it's best to, to pick the simplest geometry possible. For example, um, region A being a half space, then the boundary is flat and you can compute it, but you can do it on a sphere or whatever region is convenient. Um, same ideas also hold for the entanglement entropy. Here are you assuming that A is larger than any scale in the system, like correlation lengths and all? all yes, so that's, that's very important. Um, this expansion is when A becomes infinite and A has uh, extent in all dimensions of your space. So and this is in a gapped theory? No, I'm not, I'm not even talking about um, necessarily quantum systems. So, so okay. far it's, it's very mathematical, it's very general. We'll put uh, concrete systems into this machine and see, but this holds for gap and gapless systems. If you specifically restrict yourself to quantum uh, Hamiltonians, but we'll see it, it's, uh, it's, it's very general so far. Okay. Um, the area law or boundary law is actually the leading term for if O is a conserved quantity at low temperature. In that case, you don't get a boundary, you don't get a volume law, you only get the boundary law and subleading corrections. So that's one example where that's the dominant part of the fluctuation. May I ask talk about a related question? Uh, yep. Um, so is, is there um, any assumptions about S of K behavior at small K or large K? Yeah, there are. Uh, so at small K, because we want F of R, if I'm just showing the previous slide, we want, or the next previous slide, we want F of R to decay fast enough at large separations. So at large R means we have constraints at small K. And these will appear uh, throughout the talk. So we'll come back to that. I'm not putting that under the rug. Just doing it now, but at the end, uh, hopefully um, this question will be answered, but I'll be happy to come yes, back. Thanks. Yeah, it's thanks. a very important point. So finally, we get to the rest. So take the variance, remove volume law, remove boundary law, and what's remaining? Okay, that's a question. And now we cannot work with generic regions A because you won't make any progress. I mean, this depends on your choice of region. So with some hindsight, we chose a region A that is this pie shaped, this pizza shaped, since we're in Chicago, uh, and has a corner of opening angle theta. And this has a few advantages. For one, it's scale invariant. I'm gonna assume that this region extends to infinity. Second, we can fill the plane with copies. You know, as you know, you can buy a pizza that spans two pi degrees. Um, Third, it's parameterized by a single parameter, the opening angle, which is a dimensionless variable. And finally, and importantly, it's also relevant on the lattice. 
because if you have a square lattice, for example, the most natural region A is a square or rectangle. And otherwise you have problems with uh, pixelizations of your region A. So a disc, for example, is not very good in a lattice, but these corners are good in a lattice as well. So here actually, uh, just to um, give you an over uh, preview, I'm showing uh, electron distribution that's sampled from the Laplin state at filling one third. And we're gonna talk about how this number of electrons fluctuates in region A as a function of this angle theta. Okay. So the goal is to isolate the rest, which instead of calling BA, I'm gonna call B of theta because theta is the parameter that uh, parameterizes region A. So let me call capital theta of A, the variance minus the volume law. Okay, so the, the volume law is simple to remove. We know what alpha is, remove that thing if it's present. And then we have to subtract the area law somehow, the boundary law. So this combination, okay, now I have uh, four subregions, A, B, C, D. If I take this combination for this theta term, which is A, B, so the half plane, A, D, which is this other half plane, minus A, C, which is this um, hourglass region. Uh, no, sorry, minus A, which is just this uh, region A, minus C, which is the opposite region. This, in fact, can show that this removes the boundary law. So what's remaining is the rest. And if you just do a bit of math and put all the, these A, B, A, D, A, and C in terms of integrals over the density row, you find that this is the correlation function that you integrate, so F integrated over B and D. So you integrate over the hourglass B and D. And now you see that um, the singular nature is much weaker because the only point where R equal to R prime is at the, the vertex. And that's a measure of zero set in the integral. So this quantity is much better behaved than the previous two. Okay, because usually correlation functions are divergent uh, at the same point. And here, that's only one point in the integral. So this is promising. Promising, but not transparent. I mean, this integral is okay. We didn't gain that much. So let's work at it, at it a bit more. And usually I don't give that much details in my talks about integrals or steps, but uh, it's actually so simple. And the result is so cute that uh, I sort of found it pedagogical to give you all the steps almost. So here we go, let's do it. So we're gonna change R prime to minus R prime. So now the integral becomes uh, f of not r minus r prime, but f of r plus r prime. And the region b gets mapped to d by invert. Okay, so now it's double integral over d of f of r plus r prime. Now just use polar coordinates, right? That's a natural geometry for that. We're in the plane. r is a real coordinate and phi is the opening angle. Not of the region, just in polar coordinates. Okay. Okay, the trick, the key trick is to introduce another set of polar coordinates now on the radial variables R and R prime. So these here are the modulus of vector R and vector R prime. So they're positive. So that's the new coordinates we're gonna introduce. S is the new radial coordinate in this R, R prime space and omega is the angle. So since R and R prime are positive, omega goes from zero to two pi. And S obviously is from zero to infinity. So now the R and R prime integrals become integrals over S and omega. This factor of S3 sine of two omega over two comes from a measure, the Jacobian. You can verify that very simply. And we have the two uh, integrals over the polar angles from zero to theta. Theta defines my region A, okay? It's the opening angle. And here the argument is mod of r plus r prime. Simplify it, you get this, s times the square root of this combination of the three angles, omega, phi, and phi prime. So we don't like the argument of f. I mean, it mixes all the variables. So let's just rescale. Define capital R as being s times this red square root. Um, and assume that the square root behaves nicely. Then the boundaries, of the S integral, which now become the R integral, still go from zero to infinity, so that's nice. And now I removed all the angle dependence from this integral. So it's dr, r cubed, f of r, and that's separate. 
you know, put that to the side and come back to it later. All the hard part, all the geometry is now in the second integral, which is over the three angles, omega phi phi prime of this thing. Because here we have um, this S, which gives you one over the square root to the three. And there's an additional one that comes from the measure ds. So you have one over square root to the four, which is the square bracket squared. The same argument as a red square root. Okay, so this integral doesn't look so nice and look so bad. Can we do it? Well, Jean-Marie Stefan can do it. <laughs> um, and here's the, uh, the answer. So, that's all there is. I mean, this is an exact result. And I didn't tell you more about f. I didn't need to. All the f dependence is encoded in this final integral. Um, it's a radial integral from 0 to infinity. It assumes f behaves nicely enough, right? Otherwise, it's divergent. But all the shape dependence is in a prefactor. And the prefactor, um, we'll remember it, because I'm going to make it appear a few times, uh, is 1 plus pi minus theta times cotangent theta. Cot theta is cosine theta over sine theta. And so for one, we see that as the angle becomes very small, okay, so theta goes to zero, there's a one over theta divergence at small angles. And we, we expect that the fluctuations, the rest becomes large at small angles because when a region is very thin, as I'm showing here, you expect large corrections at a boundary law because, you know, for example, charge, if it's moving around, can move very easily out of this region. Um, so that's reasonable, but it's, we don't have a theorem that it has to be one over theta, that's what it is. And the opposite limit where the angle is nearly pi, so when region A is a half plane, uh, you expand this and you see that it's theta minus pi squared times the coefficient alpha. And alpha is just this thing times some number coming from the Taylor expansion of this corner, this corner function. So I'm not saying more about alpha because we don't know more about alpha at this point. I'm gonna call this uh, function in parentheses, one plus pi minus theta cotan theta, the corner fluctuation function, just because it seems to describe fluctuations of many systems in this geometry. And now this integral, let's see what it contains physically. So if you Fourier transform this, which is a good thing to do, uh, you find that a prefactor probes a long wavelength limit of the static structure factor. Okay, so this integral is equal to some number times the second derivative of SFK evaluated at k equal to zero. So that's a low energy, long wave vector, uh, small wave vector, long distance property of the system, which is very different from the beta coefficient of the boundary law we just saw. So this now probes uh, long distance physics or chemistry or biology. I didn't say what kind of F function we're playing with. Uh, and that's nice. And so now let's test it. Let's see examples and let's see also specifically the integral, what it gives you. So let's start with a class of systems that's very interesting for Chicago because there's many experts uh, at Chicago that work on fractional quantum Hall states. And we're going to talk about charge fluctuations in incompressible quantum Hall states. Okay, so it's only half 50 minutes, so I have to start somewhere, and that'll be it. So at filling fraction nu, it is known that the structure factor as k goes to zero, goes to zero as k squared, and a prefactor is filling fraction over four pi. And that's actually a very general property that's true for any FQH or any quantum Hall state, in fact. Um, you know, the reference, I'm not even sure what's the best reference, there are many references, but uh, this paper by uh, Tankud Khan, Laskin, and Paul Wigman uh, phrases it very nicely. Uh, the leading term, and I'm quoting, and the structure factor does not depend on the quantum Hall state. This is a consequence of conservation of particle number and angular momentum. In reference 44, 46, are GMP, Gervin, McDonald, Platzman. Um, you can, you know, bring that back to uh, some rules about classical fluids. So Stillinger and Forrester and other people. Uh, it's a long list, but GMP is where I think this, these things became concrete for uh, FQH. So that's 
you know, people in the, in the field would say it's a trivial property of the static structure factor. Yeah. So using this property, we can predict that the fluctuations for a region with a corner angle theta is exactly this. There is no fudge factors, there's no nothing. So it's nu over four pi times the super function. And let me set electric charge at h bar to one. I can rewrite that in terms of the um, Hall conductivity sigma xy. And that's for any quantum Hall state, incompressible. And this agrees with an exact result for integer quantum Hall states at filling one. So that's simplest check you can do and it passes that check. So the check we wanted to do is what about FQH? What about uh, non-trivial FQH states? So we chose a Laughlin wave function, model wave function at filling fraction one third for fermions and one half for bosons. That's a wave function. And one of our new appears um, in these ZI minus ZJ factors, which are the complex coordinates of the electrons. So both one third and one half describe topologically ordered phases um, and have anion excitations and blah, blah, blah. So that's very interesting, but here we're just, just gonna focus on the ground state for this test. So Jean-Marie Stefan uh, used a Monte Carlo analysis to numerically directly evaluate the variance of the charge inside region A, which is shown here. And that's an exact distribution that he got from this wave function. You just sample over billions of distributions. There's a subtlety because uh, when you take a finite number of particles, which we will do, in fact, we went up to 48 particles, uh, then these electrons form a droplet, and this droplet has a boundary. But, you know, we know what the boundary contribution is, and you can subtract that. Uh, and so that, that can be taken care of. But it's not entirely trivial, but it's uh, fairly simple. This was done. And that's the, <clears throat> that's the data. So I have four lines here. Uh, three are Monte Carlo, and the last, the orange line, is the exact result. It was this one, nu over four pi squared times corner function. They all collapse. Okay, so the, the purple one is IQH at filling one, green is FQH filling one half, and blue is FQH at one third. <clears throat> and you know, I could show like other plots where you see deviations more clearly. There are some numerical errors, obviously, but uh, I won't because it's spot on. Um, and here they collapse because we normalize the fluctuation function over nu. So for FQH or QH states, fluctuations scale with the filling fraction, divide by that, and you get the same angle dependence for all states. And that's what we see. Uh, one could go and further test this with our wave functions, for example, non-abelian FQH states. And we have no doubt this will work. We didn't do it. Test 1.2. We're still in the quantum hall realm, but let's leave aside ground states. They're interesting, but they're very constrained. So let's look at a class of excited states uh, at filling one. So I'm gonna fill exactly the nth Landau level, okay? And leave all other empty. So when n is bigger than zero, that's an excited state, it has very large energy and it's uh, unrealistic, but it's an exact state. It's Gaussian, so I can verify things exactly, uh, paper and pencil. So doing that, you find the same corner function, obviously. Um, and the prefactor is no longer a filling fraction because it's one for all these excited states. For any n, this is true for any n. Instead of uh, the filling fraction, which would be one, we see it's two n plus one. <clears throat> so only when uh, n is zero do we have the filling fraction, otherwise it's this other factor. And you know we don't have a very simple reason for why it's like that, but what I can tell you is that it's reasonable because higher excited states, so the higher the n, the more excited the state is, you expect to have stronger fluctuations for that state because things are more delocalized, there's more energy, there's more motion around. Is that what we see here? So that's reasonable, but I don't have any very deep reason for why it's two n plus one. <clears throat> so that's one example where it's not a ground state and things work uh, perfectly. Let's now continue our tests 
still in quantum systems. I think I'm only only going doing quantum systems in this talk because I don't have much time. Um, so this class of Hamiltonians will be gapless Hamiltonians described at low energy by conformal field theories, CFTs, in two spatial dimensions. So in two plus one, as people sometimes say, because the plus one is time. Uh, these theories generally don't have quasiparticles. They don't have long-lived excitations because interactions are very strong. Um, examples, for example, are massless direct fermions and graphene. This has quasiparticles. Uh, an example where you don't have is the Ising or XY quantum critical point. Okay. Another interesting example is quantum electrodynamics in two plus one dimensions with massless Dirac fermions. That's a phase, it's not a critical point. And that describes some spin liquids in condensed matter. And there's a long list of CFTs. These are just examples uh, to keep in mind. Excuse me, may I ask a quick question? Yes, please. Um, so in the two point function of uh, these density correlation functions, I would have expected there to be a UV divergence just as R minus R prime goes to zero. Are you just saying that that just doesn't contribute at all to any of these quantities? It's a good question. I mean, in the previous discussion, it's all included. You know, these are gapped phases and it's not even quantum field theory, it's first quantization, so. Right, right. I didn't write down the Fs actually for these states, but you can compute the Fs at any R, including R equal to R prime. For CFTs, I didn't say what F is, I guess you can read my slide faster than I do. Uh, but indeed, when the point is coincidental, when R equal to R prime, uh, or when the argument of F is zero, then you have some problems. And I'm not gonna discuss those problems because they don't affect the rest, but they do affect the first uh, two terms, the volume and boundary law. We can talk about that at some point later, but uh, I won't talk about it in the talk. Great, thank you. The physics that uh, the corner, uh, is a low energy property and it doesn't matter, but it's a very important point because the boundary law coefficient, you know, that guy cares about that physics, but not this corner term, but it's, uh, we can come back to that. Later. So let's start uh, for CFTs with again, charge fluctuations. So I'm gonna consider some global U1 charge in a system. So you have a three vector JMU, that's a mu equal to zero or time component of this three current at equal time. <clears throat> so in the ground state, the kinetic correlation function of the charge density is minus Cj over R to the four. Um, Cj is some positive number that depends on the theory. And four is protected by symmetry and it's not sensitive to interactions. It's the same power for any CFT, irrespective of how interacting it is. The CJ is nice, but you can relate it to an even more concrete quantity, which is the ground state longitudinal conductivity, sigma XX, as follows. So sigma XX is pi squared over CJ, no, pi squared times CJ over two. So I prefer to frame things in terms of sigma XX, the ground state longitudinal conductivity of the CFT. So take this correlation function, one over R to the four, and plug it in into our expression. The prefactor is R3 times one over R to the four. Okay, so that's divergent. That's the answer you get. You get, according to the formula, the same angle dependence, but then you have a log divergence that diverges with the perimeter of region A and diverges also with the short distance cutoff that I had to put delta. And that a priori sounds bad, but in fact, the prefactor sigma xx over pi squared is not polluted with microscopic information like delta because there's a logarithm. So if I change my delta to 1.1 times delta or delta over pi, this only pollutes the constant part, but not the prefactor because log of a product is a sum of logs. So that's a recurring theme when we deal with such <clears throat> logarithmic terms, the prefactor is universal. And so that's good. That's, that's good. And you might not trust our derivation because we assume that F decays fast enough and that's very valid. And in our paper, we have um, an explicit derivation of the variance of A using different methods. We start um, concretely with one over R to the four and perform steps which are different from the ones I just shown you and you get the same answer. Everything the same exactly. 
and I don't have the reference on this slide, but I should. This expression was also found for free direct fermions that are massless by uh, Loïc Hervieux, Karen Lehur, and uh, Christophe Mora uh, in 2019. That's for free direct fermions. And so this agrees with what they found, but this is general for any CFD. And this brings me to the question I had earlier, what are the constraints in the structure factor or F of R? So clearly if F decays too slowly, then you know, bad things will happen. And one of our R to the four is actually marginal. It's the limiting case. If you decay slower than one over R to the four, bad things will happen. If you decay faster, then no problem. The, the integral is uh, UV convergent. If you decay exactly as one over R to the four, it's fine still. That's what you get here with this log divergence. It's still okay. Um, so let's see now what happens if you deviate from R to the four, one, one over R to the four, especially yeah, if you decay too slow. Uh, about this case. So here, here you look yes. at the ground state. Uh, if you had done this in a thermal state, would it just have been the, the DC connectivity instead of, the, instead of this CJ? Very good question. And the simple answer is I don't know. Um, the longer answer is, so then you'll have also, for example, a volume law, if it's fine temperature, and so it depends on temperature and the region size. Um, but I don't think it would be the DC limit defined as in transport measurements where you take sigma of omega and take omega goes to zero um, and T finite. I think it would be, uh, that's much too complex of a quantity to be captured by this simple fluctuation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but it's, I actually don't know, but it's a good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now let's go look at things when, you know, quote unquote, shit hits the fan and shit will hit the fan. <laughs> so let's look at another observable that's present in all CFDs because conserved charge for U1 current, it's not for all CFDs but all reasonable CFDs have an energy density. So the stress tensor or energy momentum tensor, T mu nu, the zero zero component of T mu nu is the energy density. And its two point function is one over R to the six times a number times CT, where CT is a stress tensor coefficient. It's a positive number and the power is predicted by symmetry, okay? And so null generality, T mu nu correlated with T lambda rho at general separations where X now is time and space, okay? This CT over X to the six times some tensor structure. That's dimensionless. Um, here, I'm just looking at the equal time part of that. And that's what you get. So one of R to the six decays fast enough. It's faster than one of R to the four, but there's a problem, you know? Uh, if you put that into the integral, you have R three times one of R to the six, and that's badly, you be there, uh, small r divergent, so uv divergent. So you need a delta to evaluate this at small distances. And the answer is, for the hard cutoff as I put here, it's minus ct over six delta squared. And that's okay, it's not the end of the world because it just tells us that for that observable, the prefactor is not captured by the CFT. You need more information about the detailed system. For example, lattice physics that is not captured by the CFT for a condensed matter perspective. And for another perspective, well, I guess two plus one D doesn't really exist, so I'm safe. <laughs> uh, so that's a microscopic prefactor, but the angle dependence should be the same. Might be harder to get because it's the, the, the prefactor is UV sensitive, but in principle, it's the same. So here, could you maybe, if you consider two states, you know, one not not the ground state and the ground state, and the difference between the two um, would have, because this is some kind of OP divergence. Um, that you could kind of cancel between two, you know, it probably doesn't care too much about which state you're measuring things in. That's true. I could play with a density matrix. I could, I could change my state, state, I mean, density matrix and look at, you know, deviations uh, from a given state. Um, and so the, the answer is probably yes, you can do more to get some universal information. But if you don't, then you don't get information that's very universal. But I agree with you, you can play more games and not stop at this uh, stupid step, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Energy density is uh, very important, but you know, a CFT has infinitely many primary operators. 
which have two, two, two point correlation function of a var that decays as one over r to the two delta, and delta is a scaling dimension of the operator. So if delta is bigger or equal to two, you get the spring universal dependence and the angle. If delta is equal to two, you still get it. You get a log prefactor. But what if delta is less than two? And so instead of doing CFTs, I'll look at metals, which give you another example where delta is less than two. So when the decay at long distances is too slow. So remember, I asked for isotropy and transition invariance. In that case, the simplest case of a metal is a circular Fermi surface. So let's get Fermi liquids. Okay, so Fermi liquids are simple metals. And at large distances, this f of r correlation function decays as one over r to the three, modulo some os oscillations from the Fermi surface. And that corresponds to delta equal to three halves in the CFT nomenclature, because three halves times two is three. Okay. So first, instead of going to the rest, let's test our expression for the boundary law coefficient, because we know that the boundary law, bad things can happen when you have a metal. And so that's my expression I showed you earlier, integral over r of r squared times f, put one over r to the three in that, and you get a log divergence. And that's in fact correct. Metals have a log enhancement of their fluctuations. And this was known from uh, Joev and Klich in 2000, whatever, seven, I forget. Uh, so we recovered that case. And so that's good. Beta is log divergent. So the boundary law is not uh, L, it's L log L. Okay, that's good. That's good and bad. I mean, the bad thing is that this can pollute the corner term. Let's continue. So the corner term, in fact, is more, more subtle in this case because uh, it's sensitive to the entire geometry, including the way the corner is cut off at large distances. Nevertheless, you can devise tricks to isolate the corner term from the boundary coefficient and the volume law coefficient by taking the second derivative with respect to the angle theta. So take the variance, take two theta derivatives of that and you find that the correction here actually in metals is linear in the perimeter of A. So I'm gonna call that L here. L is like the, uh, the pi, it's the radius of the pi. So that's different from CFT. It's not log L, it's L, that's a subleading term. And this uh, script or math frac B of theta function uh, is this, is not the spring universal function I just showed you before. It's much more involved. It involves Catalan constant, capital C, dialogarithm, logs and sins. And so, and here I'm normalized by the smooth limit coefficient alpha to make it simpler, but it's distinct. And this was anticipated from the fact that F decays too slowly and our derivation breaks down in that case. But that's what the answer is if you follow this, this prescription for metals. Um, so I won't talk much about this because I want to move on to entanglement. Um, if you have questions, you can come back to that at the end. So the entanglement entropies, okay? So it has a very similar starting point as for bipartite fluctuations. You specify a state and a bipartition. One crucial difference is that we don't specify the observable here. That's all, just the state and the geometry, that's it. So it's a more fundamental quantity. It's also more difficult to compute. More specifically, given a density matrix rho hat, now we're in quantum systems, right? Because you need a quantum system to define that. You have a density matrix rho hat. It's restriction to a subregion A. You trace over the outside of A, which is A complement. And that's my reduced density matrix rho A. The Rennie entropies for any Rennie index that's non-negative is one over one minus N times log of trace over rho A to the N. Standard formula, you get von Neumann, you take limit as n goes to one, which is minus trace of rho log rho, the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix rho A. And so this quantity S of A roughly measures how much are A and A complement entangled. The goal here is to understand the shape dependence of the entanglement entropy as a function of a corner of angle theta and compare it to what we had for the fluctuations where the answer was very simple and super universal. It's a much more difficult task uh, because S of A is not a local quantity like fluctuations. 
So we have to be less ambitious and we're gonna restrict ourselves to isotropic and transition invariant states, ground states of topological phases and CFTs only. So very specific. And in fact, only specific subset of those states. We can first ask a question, what happens as we did before when the region A is very large, what's the expansion? So in the ground state, the first term is not the, the volume law, it's the boundary law for the entropy. Okay, so B is some microscopic quantity and that's the length of the boundary. And then you have the rest. And here I broke it up into two contributions, gamma geometric and gamma topological. I don't care about gamma topological because corner angle doesn't change topology of the region A, that stays constant. So this part, I won't talk about, it's only the red part. For gap states, the geometric gamma, I'm gonna call it A of theta, like B of theta before, but now it's A of theta for entanglement entropy. And that's independent of the size of region A. Because you have a finite correlation length, a finite gap. And so in the end, this term does not vary with the length of the boundary. For CFTs, that's not the case, there's no gap. And this coefficient, in fact, grows logarithmically with the boundary of region A. And that's just the same as we had fluctuations for B of theta. We also had this log divergence, but here we have it for the entanglement entropy. And the prefactor, I'm gonna call it A of theta as well. Depends on the Renyi index. I didn't show it that on top here, but it also depends on the Renyi index. This corner function A of theta, in fact, has a nice property. It's even about pi because A of two pi minus theta is the same as A of theta because the entropy of the complement is the same as the entropy of the state because we're dealing with pure states, the ground state. So we have this nice constraint. Uh, and this constraint, together with the fact that theta equal to pi is non-singular, when you reach the plane that, that the corner disappears in a non-singular fashion, this corner function will vanish as some constant lambda times theta minus pi squared. So the same way as we had before, but here we can actually um, prove it quote unquote for general ground states. So what is lambda n? It's interesting the question to ask. And for CFTs, we know much more and lambda n equal to one von Neumann is equal to a constant times CT, the same CT we had before, the stress tensor coefficient. And more physically, CT is in fact proportional to the shear viscosity of the ground state. So the shear viscosity of a CFT at finite frequency omega is some coefficient eta zero times frequency squared. So it's this eta zero that appears uh, proportional to CT. So it's a local observable that determines the corner entanglement and the near smooth limit. And that's a special fact of the fact that, uh, that the corner is almost disappearing. Because for generic angles, we don't expect local observables to determine the entanglement entropy. It's a special feature of this nearly smooth limit. Uh, could you explain again why as theta goes to pi, A has to vanish? There's no corner. But there's still an entanglement entropy between the top half and the bottom half of the system, right? Sure, there's a boundary law. I see, okay, good, okay, yeah. thanks. Or topological terms, but there's no corner coefficient. Yeah, so yeah. But yes, there are other terms, but this corner term, which is the rest, for the corner and non-topological contribution, that advantage. So here, uh, showing for von Neumann, the corner function divided by the smooth limit coefficient lambda one versus theta for many different systems. And in fact, each subsystem, each system here shown in the legend uh, is worth one or a few papers uh, worth of work. And there are some references at the bottom, but I'm not making justice to all this hard work, but it's very hard to get this quantity actually. Uh, this is the sort of synthesizing result of a lot of years of work. And the first thing that strikes the eye is that if you normalize by this constant lambda, all these curves nearly collapse at the same curve. Not exactly, there are deviations and you see them at smaller angles, but they nearly collapse. Let's see what are the systems here. Uh, so a free scalar CFT, that's Klein Gordon, uh, the O-N Wilson-Fisher fixed point at large N, that's the orange one. Green is a free Dirac fermion, um, magenta, whatever. Orange is ADS-4 CFT-3, that's a holographic CFT. Purple is not entanglement, it's fluctuations as before. It's this function one plus pi minus theta times cotangent theta. 
but it's still there. It's in that forest of lines. Uh, here we have integer quantum Hall state at filling one, at filling two. And we have three data points only at pi over two because these come from large scale numerics and lattice spin models. These are quantum critical points in the Eisen universality class, in the XY universality class, and in the Heisenberg universality class. That's work from Roger Malko and his group. Beautiful work, very hard to get. And the lambda there is known from Bootstrap, actually. So it's a lot of references to give you this, 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 uh, this plot. And so things are fairly um, quasi-universal. Let me use that word, okay? But there are deviations and uh, I can't say more at this point because it's very hard to derive things from first principles. If we zoom in, I can mention some interesting things. Um, the lowest curve is ADS CFT and the highest curve is the free scalar or the Wilson Fisher CFT, which are the same at large end. And with uh, Pablo Bueno and Rob Myers, we predicted, conjectured that ADS CFT is a lower bound and the free scalar is an upper bound. And lo and behold, all curves that we know fall in between. This is the angles between 0.6 and 0.85. So we see the spread. If the angle is too large, we don't see the spread. The curves are too collapsed. The fluctuation function, which is in purple here, I'm pointing it, it's a third line from the bottom, is sort of snug in the middle. <laughs> Why? No, no, it's not entanglement property. It's some fluctuation of some local observable. Why is it in there? We don't know. We don't know. A lot of questions. So let me just flash you some results that are not published. So don't scoop us. Uh, unpublished work with uh, Jean-Marie Stéphane and Benoit Estienne, the same co-authors as in the first paper I mentioned. Again, on the Laughlin wave function. So we wanna know the corner coefficient for Laughlin at some uh, fillings like one half and one third. Since we, can do, we cannot do von Neumann, we have to uh, be content with the second Rennie entropy because there we have this nice swap trick where you take two copies of your Laughlin wave function swap correlations on region A, take the average and you get S2 from that. So that's what I'm plotting here. That's a corner term for Laughlin at filling fraction one half and one third as a function of the corner opening angle from zero to pi. And this is for either 48 or 64 electrons in the droplet. And what's interesting is that the corner coefficient is not normalized here, it's raw data. Uh, the corner coefficient is bigger for filling fraction one third than one half. And that's the opposite trend that we had for fluctuations. For fluctuations, B of theta was proportional to theta strictly. But here actually one third has a bigger entanglement prefactor than its bosonic cousin would have. Again, we don't know why, because we don't have first principle answers for this um, complicated object. Uh, but just showing the different particle numbers shows you that this data is pretty well converged. I mean, there are some errors, obviously, and you see some funny bumps at, uh, at large angles, but it's still, it's pretty reasonable. So it's, it's, I would say, good data, although I'm no expert. Let's play the same game. That's my last plot of results. I'm going to normalize this Rennie corner function by the smooth limit coefficient lambda, okay? and plotted a function of theta. And so here the data points are from for FQH, at filling fraction one half in blue and one third in orange. And then we have the free scalar CFT, the rack CFT, the fluctuation function, and integer quantum Hall states at filling one and two. And again, you see very good collapse, at least for the non-FQH states, the collapse is pretty damn good. Uh, for the FQH states, they're a bit, larger, you see at smaller angles that they're clearly above the other points, including the free scalar. Uh, but bear in mind that getting the lambda two coefficient is very imprecise for these finite size calculations. So these FQH curves that are normalized uh, have error bars that I'm not showing. And these error bars are not small. But at angles that are, you know, say bigger than one radian, I mean, in this range, the collapse is, quasi exact. It's not exact because if I zoom in, you see deviations, but it's uh, it's intriguing. <laughs> Why doesn't this curve do this? You know, there's no reason. Um, no one can give you a reason for why 
these curves are so so closed numerically. All right, that's all my time. Let me recap. Um, the main part of the talk was to convince you that bipartite fluctuations are interesting. And if you look at a corner geometry as shown here, this pie shape, in fact, they're super universal and the super is important. So almost any system you take will have the same angle dependence. And that's given by this super corner function, one plus pi minus theta times cotangent theta. And the prefactor is some low energy property of uh, your state for quantum systems, for other systems, and you have to put the right words on that. Um, but you can imagine like putting bacteria, <laughs> looking at fluctuations of bacteria, and looking at corrections to the boundary and volume laws. And we predict that if bacteria are well behaved, then you have this dependence. But I might be wrong, but I'd be happy to see me, to see someone prove me wrong on this. In the second part, we talked about a more difficult measure because this measures entanglement between region A and its complement. But we saw that uh, surprisingly it behaves very similarly to this function given above. But deviations are present and you can quantify them, but they're not big. Okay, and we don't know why they're not big. It's something that I spend evenings thinking about. Maybe I waste my time, but I still do. <laughs> um, and then in the process, I showed you some new results for FQH states. In fact, these are the first results for the corner function of an interacting gap system. So it's pretty non-trivial work from Jean-Marie Stéphane. Outlook, looking to the future. Uh, obviously, this is the tip of the iceberg, you know, pun intended. <laughs> Fluctuations can be looked at in other geometries. You know, why the plane? Why not on a sphere, the cylinder, the torus, you know, you name it. And dimensions, why two dimensions? No need to have two dimensions. 3D is fine. And 6D I don't care about, but you know, if you care about mathematics, you can try. And similar things will happen again. You know, I didn't talk about details of two dimensions. Similar properties will happen as long as you have a shape to define. In one plus one D, you know, it's intervals and things like that. It's hard to define a shape. The shapes are very simple, but here in higher dimensions, you have shapes and you can talk about things like cones, cubes. Uh, different polyhedra, and uh, you'll have similar properties. Experiments. Um, one experiment that you can work with is, for example, the classical fluid. You take, say, um, water, an interface with water and air, and you put some colloidal particles on this interface, and you look at the particle variance in a subregion. You can do that using, you know, photography essentially, you just count how many colloidal particles you have and you do many samples and you see whether this dependence is a beta or not, bacteria or cold atoms and so forth. Um, lastly, but most importantly for me, going back to entanglement, uh, it, would be this, it would be good to understand what controls this corner function, A of theta for the Rennie entropies, especially away from the smooth limit to see why it's so constrained to look like the fluctuation corner function. Why don't we see more deviations? Um, these are questions I would like to see answered. And these are my funding agency. And again, I thank my co-authors that I showed on the first page and all the people I didn't cite. So thank you. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to uh, oblige. Okay, let's thank uh, William for the very nice uh, and interesting talk. Uh, and we still have time for maybe a few questions. Maybe I'm gonna flash my recap. So if you have a question, you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask it. I have a quick question. So um, the original discussion of bipartite fluctuations, uh, do you think, it, would it be, is there any hope to generalize that discussion to fields living on curved manifolds? Yes. Yes, so when I was talking about in the outlook about other geometries, I meant, for example, the sphere. Because uh, the sphere is a nice geometry, as you know, and you can define corners on a sphere. Uh, take great circles or geodesics that intersect at an angle theta. 
Um, and so when you work with FQH states, you work on a sphere often. And so that's a geometry that you can work with. And I suspect that you get the same corner function because it's a very local property. You know, the corner only feels a very small part of the manifold. No, your manifold is not smooth enough, then yeah, the things will be very different. But uh, I, I don't have the exact answer, but I suspect that you'll find this function and other smooth enough manifolds. Um, it depends on, you know, the curvature of the manifold and the size of region A, right? So there's an interplay and you have to have this a sweet spot where you can have this nicely defined corner. But uh, the sphere is uh, my favorite candidate for generalization. Because things like uh, the torus and cylinder are flat. So they're not that interesting from this perspective. Yeah, that's a great question. May I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in the beginning, you were talking about the square uh, region A. Uh, can you make a statement about a closed region which doesn't, uh, which has more than one corner yeah. uh, based on uh, your results? Yeah, you know, that's an omission from the talk. I should have mentioned this. Um, because I was showing squares and in the end I want to talk about the pie shape because a pie shape is more amenable to analytical treatment. But the point is that if A decays fast enough, then this corner contribution will be a sum from all the geometric corners in region A. So if your F is local enough, then each corner contributes its own B of theta for a given angle. So for a square, as shown here, you'll have four times b of pi over two for you know a large square. Um, the same happens for the entropy of squares, triangles, and things like that. So you have this decomposition due to the local nature of the corner, um, because this contribution is geometric. It's not a topological contribution, which cares about the topology of your uh, manifold or submanifold. So in this case, uh, it should factorize. So you should have a sum over all, assuming your F decays fast enough. That's a very important proviso. Are there a system where this has been checked? For bipartition and fluctuations, uh, yes. So in this paper by Hervieu, Karine Lehur, and Mora in 2019, they looked at fluctuations for different parallelograms for free direct fermions gapless free direct fermions on a lattice. And they found that it indeed factorizes. You had the sum over different corners. Uh, for the entanglement entropy, uh, this was also checked for free systems, free scalar, free fermion, but also checked in holography. No, no, sorry, holography, it's the pie shape. Um, checked for the, um, I believe, uh, for the um, Ising, XY, and Heisenberg quantum critical points by Melko and company. So this has been checked in many systems, both free and interactive. Um, and yeah, and I have uh, no doubt about its validity, assuming F decays fast enough. If it doesn't decay fast enough, then you know you have problems because F knows about everything in a whole region. And so this locality of the corner is sort of lost from the non-locality of F. And metals are one example where you get some problems, but it's still, get something. But for gap phases, yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, because if your region A is large compared to correlation length, boom, it factorizes. It has to. It has to. Because it's a local observable. I had another quick question, if possible. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I just wanted to come back to Emil's question earlier on. So you start out with an integral uh, basically over a bounded region, a double integral over A. Then you say that you're going to assume that it's translation invariant, so it depends only on R minus R prime. How do you ever yeah. get an integral from R going to infinity if you just start out with a bounded integral like that? Okay, just a so, little confused there. Yeah. So here, for example, right? So I start, that's my starting point, this equation that I'm highlighting with my cursor. 
Um, here, I didn't specify region A. Well, it's, it's, that's a schematic square, but so let's take A to be this uh, infinite corner, this pi. It's a pi portion of infinite extent. So angle is theta, but the radial extent goes from the origin to infinity. That's my starting point. Um, ah, okay. So okay. Integral, so a, it's already, a is just yeah, unbounded. Exactly, A is already unbounded Great, that, that from the start. Yes. But if you take A to be bounded, then uh, there is more discussion to be had. And then you get more dependence on what's the state and things like that. And um, that's, a reason, that's a reason why we didn't take a bounded region. We didn't want to have to discuss specifics. But when A has a size, then the size matters because the, the correlation function F has some knowledge about some lengths, you know, like correlation length of that correlator. So then size matters, if I put it uh, succinctly. Thanks. Yeah. But in the integrals, yeah, it's all um, the upper bounds for the radial coordinates are always infinity. Otherwise, it's not nice. Because, you know, here I rescaled the R variable, you know, so R is just this radial coordinate rescaled by this angle function. If the upper bound is finite, then you have angle dependence on the upper bound. And this will mess, you don't factorize anymore. This will mess around, it's more complicated. So that's a specific case where you see how it becomes more complex when the region is bounded. Great, thanks so much.